uh, investing time. Um, yeah, but I, after a few days of this convention, um, I have the feeling that my decision is very Israel specific mm -hmm. and it's kind of, um, maybe it will sound weird to people coming from other places with different, uh, because we, we saw some very different um, position on the subject of housing. Like you have the people from Brazil and the and the, the person, the architect from India. And I know that people from Japan, for example, or from Northern Europe are very different, they're a very different position than people from Israel or from people from the United States in this regard. So, but that's, it the, is, uh, that's the beauty it, of it, right? It, so. I think that's yeah that's a beauty but it's also um, right. it's it's difficult because something that might seem revolutionary for one person like like in in the United States if you talk about uh, uh, healthcare like uh, um, single-payer healthcare you're uh, uh, anarchist or a, a reformer but in the rest of the world is well, okay so <laughs> I was just thinking that maybe things that for me looks like a, a revolution may, look, may seem very much mundane to other people or just out of the question for... No, but I think but it question. plays back, I mean, you, you know, you'll... Con I think that's part of the, the beauty of this is that you start to question some of the terms to, you know, to stress that term, but the terms that you assume are natural, or are, are given and you start to question those. Right? Yeah. Uh, on, one, on the one hand, on the other hand, if you're coming from my position, which is not, um, not an academic position, but an activist position, then um, you're, it's, it's not too good to be too much academic about the terms because you can lose the, the big picture or the, the you need to talk in a way that people will understand you in your country. No, no, of course. But I mean, what I'm saying precisely is that I mean, terms, both in terms of the words, but also mm -hmm. what is implied by the words, right? So even whatever, whatever vocabulary you use, there's a certain set of values that's attached to those. Yeah. That's what I, mean. I would add that actually, I think it's really important to exactly discuss or part of what we've been kind of talking about is exactly how terms would function really differently in an activist situation than in an academic one. And those are things we actually have to understand better. Um, so that to me is just- Yeah. Although I think an activist situation would be very, very site specific and, and country specific because, yeah. or even like city specific. So um, yeah, it, it is difficult think uh. okay well let's let's thread that conversation through the panel thank you to everybody yeah. for joining uh, this morning or this afternoon um, I'm assuming some more people will join and come in and out this is a panel called um, edges of the market um, which is an interesting way of framing that things happen in in blurry uh, border conditions neither within entirely within nor without the market. We have four presentations today, which are very different, uh, very different case studies and different focuses. Um, Jesse Lockhart will, is, is the, the host or the co-host, she will be showing videos. And we're gonna start with Mariana Fix. You've probably by now seen Mariana um, asking questions and moderating in a very great way. She introduced uh, Sylvia Knapp. Um, Mariana, just as a reminder, is a professor at the University of Sao Paulo in the School of Architecture and Urbanism, as well as visiting scholar at the Institute of Economics at Unicamp. Um, she holds a PhD in economics, a master's degree in sociology, and a professional degree in architecture and urbanism. So a unique combination of um, expertise and disciplinary focus, um, and um, has worked in Brazil for a long time on transformations of the housing sector, in particular its financialization under 
um, new regimes of investment. Um, she's a member of the Housing and Human Settlements Laboratory at the School of Architecture and Urbanism at the University of Sao Paulo and has been working with Right to the City organizations um, for several years. So I'm going to hand off to Mariana. Her keyword is speculation. And I think there will also be some reflection on the use of the word in Portuguese versus uh, English to pick up another thread of different contexts and different terms. So thank you, Mariana. Yeah, me too. No sound? Um, no sound? Okay, I'll start it again. Um, did you check, uh, Jesse, did you check the use computer audio before you do this, this screen sharing? Hello and thank you for coming. My name is Mariana Fix. I hope to make a contribution to our overall goal of this conference by exploring a term that's in commonly used in the context of house and cities, but less often theorized. I will discuss the term speculation in the context Further, I will try to tackle the concern expressed by the research group uh, that has organized uh, this event, of which I am a part, to better understand the role of architecture in these transformations. My point of view for the problem was constructed on the basis of an interdisciplinary perspective. It was also a geographically located point of view, since I am a scholar situated in Latin America who seeks to observe the world system based on historically constituted hierarchical and unequal relations in the movement of capitalist uh, expansion. My initial research into urban planning and the right to, the, to housing led me to the challenge of trying to better understand the workings of real estate market, which demanded field work documental research and market data analysis, including its different agents, land uh, owners, developers, construction companies, banks, asset management offices, investors, architectural firms, etc. I also set out to study real estate speculation processes in other countries, particularly in the United States, owning to its global hegemony and influence, especially over Latin America. This does not mean that I take the view that these are models imposed from outside or mere copies. Rather, these are processes that connect with domestic interest and business in in standards and were thus modified in each context. Some of these models were just stated precisely in the 80s with the neoliberalization of urban policies advocating for public-private partnerships, PPP, my first research topic, and for the market as supposedly the best way to allocate the resources and occupy the territory. Let's take a look at uh, some of them. In the US, many changes to the regulatory framework were made in the name of the belief that, open quote, the genus of a market economy freed of the distortions forced by government housing policies and regulations can provide for housing far better than federal programs, as concluded a commission created by the Reagan government. These transformations made possible certain models of housing credit that previously would have been illegal, like the subprime system, the trigger of the 2008 crisis, which burst the housing bubble and led to the eviction of thousands of families. 
in Spain, the article of the Constitution that established that every citizen has the right to dignified and adequate housing was strongly violated. This was depicted uh, in the suggestively titled film Speculation Nation, which deals with the development tsunami, tsunami urbanizador in Spanish, that preceded the crisis and its consequences. It's worth noting the importance of the 1998 land law, Ley de Usos, we freed up land that previously could not be developed and thus made the speculative wave possible. In Sweden, open quote, the housing sector went from being one of the most regulated in Europe to the most uh, liberal market, as argued by Herring, Clark, Lundholm and Manberg. Even Cuba, which has not adopted neoliberal policies, nor a neoliberal framework, is implementing transformations, including the permission of real estate activities that may foster speculative practices. See the work, of, for instance, of Alini Migliori presented at this seminar. I believe these cases provide sufficient evidence to justify my interest in the question of speculation. They also show that the car speculative character of the housing market has been exacerbated in the period we are dealing with here. Speculative processes are entwined in, no, in whole uh, spatial organi organization of the city. They manifest themselves in price increases, real estate bubbles and evictions, whether episodic or continuous. At the same time, they are entwined in the system of wealth accumulation and distribution all the way from the institution of capitalist private property of land. Hence, they are entwined in patterns of wealth accumulation that change over time and in patterns of spatial production that are different in each social formation. Elsewhere, I've discussed the hypothesis that this exacerbation of speculation in places that are so different from one another in different social formations is related to an increase in branchism, i.e. gains resulting from the ownership of assets associated with financialization of the economy, and that these processes though global, takes on different forms and unfolds in different ways in each place. Rentist gains refer to the future expectations that are in the sense inherently speculative. There is speculation about what might be built in each plot of land and about each location uh, and its posed vocation. In several places, there have been pressures for change in the regulatory framework for housing since the 80s. Ever more deregulated housing policies, determined by the market and by private interests, relying on legislative change in their favor, subsidies, state lands and large-scale dispossession, are presented as the only alternative of mass housing provision all over the world. However, it's important to investigate how politics, policies and finance are interconnected and what results and impacts they produce in each context. The singularity of the real estate market rests on bringing together into a single activity the three forms in which surplus value appears. Profit, excess value produced on building site, sites, interest, part of the excess value that remunerate those who supply the funding, in other words, the monetary resources for production, and uh, rent, uh, capitalized excess value embedded in price of land. The production of the build-up space displays an immediate relation with the financial market, whether via the need to finance the production or via the need to make feasible the consumption. Furthermore, urban land, a fundamental element of the real estate sector, has its price determined just like financial assets, i.e. by the current value of expected future rent. Speculative pricing practices are inherent to capitalist land and property markets. A price increment is generally called valorization, a term that in several languages has a positive connotation, as appreciation does in English. 
In Portuguese, areas with higher land prices are generally termed valorized areas, areas valorizadas in Portuguese. However, at least within the theoretical framework of political economy, the price of land is neither determined by a known value, which does not have, nor by conjunctural market factors, like the specific demand and supply of lands, as argued by Grespan. If, he, if any rent can be capitalized, the demand and supply of land compete with those of other actual elements of production and of other property titles relating to debts, all of which make up a group of alternatives to invest money capital. Where does architecture, strictly speaking, come in? The valorization of the site by construction and the urbanization is added to the price of empty land. This permits fictitious projections of the price of the houses to be built as if all this was accounted by the value transferred to them by the construction work. The construction stage, i.e. the production of the house use value, creates surplus value and lots of it, as discussed by Sergio Ferro but it also creates the grounding on which speculation takes place based on the value of the house being built and the house that will be built in the areas valorized by the present uh, construction. It is a present value that, projected by the current interest rate, represents future values, as argued by Grespin. For this reason, reason generally, it's the land rent, not the house, that's the true object of speculation. Beyond land rent, architecture is also capable of producing other forms of rentist gains. Above all, the style of architecture of unique, exceptional form, which Pedro Arantes named rent of form. In an analogy to the rent received by brands produced by their differential of exclusivity. And great architects, at least uh, those most recognized by the system of professional prizes, are the main specialists in produ introducing as much rent of form as possible from each work, despite of their exorbitant uh, production costs. In the quest for exceptionality, architectural practice participates in the formation of monopoly prices, which award extra profit. Singularity supports the formation of differential prices that do not correspond to any value. The rent is, or allegedly is, the issue is controversial, later captured by means of the work's visibility of its entrepreneur, of the city itself, which starts welcoming more tourists, receiving greater flows of money and more attention from the so-called uh, creative class, all important factors in the dominant narrative of uh, competition between cities. The subprime crisis in the United States and the real estate bubble in Spain generated resistance movement, movements such as Occupy Your Home Atlanta in the US and the Plataforma de Atingidos por Hipotecas in Spain, among others. Financialization exacerbates speculative processes, increasing their scale and introducing new characters. This alters the structure of the conflicts and the dispute in the production of the built-up space. These changes allow us to better understand the new rationality that transforms subjectivity by expanding itself to all the spheres of existence in the interpretation of authors like Dardou and Laval. Movements such as Occupy Your Homes Atlanta, for instance, notice how difficult it was to organize the families affected by foreclosure since they felt that they were to blame for their own eviction, not relating it to a broader processes, process. The City Life Movement produced a video called the Bank Attack that tries to identify the enemy against which one must organize to fight evictions. Let us see the, the first, the very beginning of this video. <laughs> No, I don't. It's 
time to wake up and get with the movement. Hear the message in the music now. We can fight back or we can lay down or beat back the bank attack and stay proud. They got bailed out. We getting sold out. Some living underwater in their own house. They hear the word foreclosure. They get scared and think it's all over. But now nah, the fight just begun. It ain't. Securitization adds a new layer of speculation onto a market that is already inherently speculative. How can one identify the enemy if the landlord of the past has now been transformed into capital in its most abstract form? When the home becomes the grounding for financial valorization, then evictions are not accident along the way, but rather part of the logic of the satanic mill of capital valorization. As well as the movement of activists and affected parties, architecture collectives in various places have for decades sought to produce architecture based on cooperative values both in the housing and public spheres, co-housing, co-authorship of designs, mutual help, self-management. They conceive their works based on use value, collective appropriations and the logic of commons, or of common communal lands, in the case of traditional populations. These practices, certainly minority practices within the profession, indicates, however, the possibility of an architecture that tries to confront speculation and does not adopt the rentist strategies, whether land rent or rental form, and also that sets up processes of production in cooperation and solidarity. Certainly, the analysis of the quality of this production adopts criteria of evaluation far removed from those of traditional prices. Community involvement, uh, cooperative and collective uh, process, the construction of the common, the ecology of knowledge and subjects that institute another architecture, more plural, social, solidarity based and sustainable. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to our live debate. Please feel free to write me at any time uh, here. There are some uh, references of my talk and I can send them to you if you wish. Thank you, Mariana, for constructing this direct connection and arc between the processes of, of real estate speculation the different layers speculation, financialization, securitization, and then actually the role, explicitly addressing the role of architecture um, in this. So I'd like to open, open this for questions and comments. Priscilla, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Mariana. Um, for such an interesting presentation. I, I've seen a few times before, Mariana was on my, my, the committee of my dissertation. Uh, but I wanted you to actually, a little bit of a, of a bad internet here, but also could you elaborate more on this notion of the rent of form? Um, yeah, just elaborate more on the notion and then maybe we can uh, um, ask a few more questions afterwards. Thanks, Priscilla. Thanks. Nice to see you here and yeah. all of you. <laughs> I was looking forward for a live debate. It's really strange, Suzanne, to see you yourself speaking. And since I'm very disciplined, I was at some point trying to pay attention on what I was saying. It's very strange. Um, but uh, so the Brent of Forma is, is a concept that is in the dissertation of uh, Pedro Arantes, I mentioned, and uh, he just published it in English, uh, it's some place here, the book, perhaps I can send it to you the reference later. But it, it, it's an effort of uh, bringing architecture to the discussion of, um, of rent or bringing rent to the discussion of architect, architecture, since architecture is an is a important way of, um, as we've seen in, in, the, in, the, in the talk and the keynote speaking, speaker uh, previously, it's also a way of doing research. And so through uh, architecture to understand um, 
how rentism is an important part of the capital accumulation uh, nowadays and and how uh, the form of of, uh, of of architecture or the form of uh, the buildings the the design of it uh, constitute um, uh, a way of um, of uh, of making some kind of uh, exclusivity in the same way as brands d does for the for the other goods usually we 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 tend to analyze uh, the other um, production, other sectors of the economy uh, as production of, of goods. And when it comes to architecture, we, we don't do the same. So, but if you think about architecture as production and you start to thinking it as uh, looking uh, as Silke Kapi tried to do uh, also in this conference, not the reception side, but also the production side, and they put them together in a geological way. So, on the, so then uh, there are other questions that you can raise, I think. And one of them is this uh, role of, um, of um, making it possible to, 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 it makes it possible to create another way of transfer of wealth, something like that. So uh, it, it doesn't matter the cost of production so much anymore because on the top of it uh, you have another layer of um, of, um, of profit that comes from uh, rent, similar to what you have um, with, with brands. I don't know if that clarifies, but I can send you something more on that later. <coughs> I have a question about the connection between land rent and uh, house pricing. Um, Sorry, was, land, uh, what did you see in the beginning? Land, land prices or land rent and uh, house, housing uh, pricing and availability. Uh, would you, do you have like a, um, a, a mapping of this uh, connection of the how how high is the part of the land in the housing prices in different parts of the places that you look at like uh, is it like 80 percent land and 20 percent building and, uh, <laughs> and construction and uh, architecture or a different percentage I would love to have that it's I think it's very hard some people try to do it and uh, it's really hard uh, because uh, it's kind of I don't know how to say it in English kind of black box do, do you say it that way mm -hmm. because uh, it's hard to have access to all the, the costs and and so on but I, I I haven't tried to do that I, I know that other people did and I can send to you some of the references but uh, what I can say is that there is always this combination of uh, profit, rent, and, and, and also interest rate. And, uh, and what also we can uh, say is that um, even if you have the same construction cost uh, in different areas of the cities, the price are, can be much different and that uh, how we explain that and then the, the concept of uh, land rent is important uh, because then you can uh, separate, uh, at least in an analytical way, things that are combined in the reality. That's why it's so different, uh, difficult to, to, to calculate that. And I think you, there are many ways in which you can uh, know enough in order to understand what's going on, even if you can't calculate exactly, precisely how much. And, uh, and that we have many examples. Uh, for instance, uh, when we have now this, um, this housing program we had in Brazil recently, uh, My Home, My Life, uh, Silke Capi mentioned it uh, briefly in her, during her talk. Uh, there is a lot of um, speculation with the land, so that's we were discussing in the other uh, session. Even if you had a huge in increase uh, in the production, that it, with if you were thinking about uh, automobile, such as um, uh, Summit was talking in in the keynote today, uh, there is a. Um, uh, economy of scale when you produce a lot of automobiles and uh, the price of each one of them go down we know that very uh, very well because that's what Henry Ford did and, 
uh, in the beginning of the, the past century. But when you do the same uh, with house, not it's not always the case and here it was actually the opposite like you had a lot of uh, production you have economy of scale so the production costs uh, certainly went down but the prices went up so then you you, you can understand that, that uh, there is a important uh, role of uh, of land rent and spe and speculation both of them well i, I would say you can even uh, uh, paraphrase Mark, uh, Karl Marx that uh, the ownership of production and the ownership of land are the same in this, uh, almost the same in this uh, situation, I would say. Like, because they have the ownership of the land, they can uh, increase the price and you cannot do anything about it. Yeah, but uh, also according to to him, you would then differentiate that when you have the means of production, it, there is a, a labor involved in the creation of value, and so in the theory of labor, uh, you would have a plus value. And uh, when you were talking about the ownership of land, you would have transfer of value created elsewhere because uh, of the ownership. So the, the title of ownership entails the its owner to get part of the create the wealth that's socially created uh, in other uh, areas and that what you really see in real estate if you think about uh, uh, real estate for instance uh, in, in brazil it has a very important role uh, in speculation uh, in different parts i think it plays a, a different uh, uh, role uh, in the economy here since uh, we don't have such a kind uh, we have a, a industrialization process in brazil was very much industrialized in, 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 during the 20th century. We, we went back to some kind of uh, uh, reprimarization of the economy. But anyway, uh, there is not the same pattern of, um, of uh, industrialization, for instance, than in the US. But uh, the, the developers here, they want to have some kind of gains that are similar to those that uh, people who, who own industries in other countries have. So this combination of getting profit from extracting uh, wealth in the labor in, uh, from labor in the working uh, site uh, wouldn't be so much. Then you have this combination with speculation. So you have both things playing together. That's what I'm trying to say. And by uh, land rent, we mean that uh, it's uh, the uh, developers are able to extract uh, more, uh, to, to, to get more uh, wealth than they would have only by the exploitation of labor in the construction size. So uh, I'm just trying to say that I, I agree with you that uh, both are kind of ownerships, but different uh, in a different way. I don't know if you, if you agree with that or if in your uh, research uh, you have a different uh, result and understanding of that. Research, but, um... I think it's very hard to disassociate the two things because uh, the the, um, the value of the land is established a lot of time by the value of the construction on it. So uh, in in many ways, the the value of the land also comes from work. Uh, from labor, so but maybe I don't know. It's the beginning. Yeah, there is there is a huge debate on on that. It's a very interesting, I think, and an important topic. There are some people that would say that the land has value in itself. Other people would say that it's price and. Uh, and uh, the value is there, but it's not in the production of the land itself. So it, the land itself is not uh, 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 the same as something produced uh, by the labor force in a factory, for instance. It, it, it is there, uh, it's nature sometimes. If you get, even if you get Polanyi, which is not, who is not a Marxist, uh, he would say it's a kind of fictitious uh, good. And uh, so it's, it's different from, uh, from the others. I think this it's is theoretical discussion, but uh, I don't know if Susanna probably wants to 
give space for more no, questions, I, I but think, uh, let's let's involve some other people. I yeah, think. yeah, sure, sure. We can um, go back to that. Uh, thank you so much, Nayrod. The land and the location and what it provides access to determines its value. Um, in that sense, it's, it is speculative because what you could possibly do with the land. Um, but yeah. But let's let's open up Anne. Okay. Well, I would just like to add something on that discussion because I think that what happens today with financialization, or this is how I understand the process, is that the um, um, that the process of land valorization happens almost independently of what you can build and um, not the access and infrastructure, but because there's so much surplus money on the market that really seeks to invest into real estate because there are no other investment options that it's just really like a the money is channeled there and it completely abstracts from the architectural product and so there's a logic within the architectural product that is very different than um, a process of valorization that is related to the potential branding that you refer to Mariana how did you do can you relate to that or does the, this sound familiar to you? Or maybe I misunderstood your presentation, which is also very possible. You mean that architecture is not that important? You mean uh, the rent of form would be, play a very important role and nowadays you would think? I think it plays a role because I think there are branding expectations. But for example, in Berlin, um, you will have really medium quality apartments that are super highly priced so i mean the quality decreases and the price increases because of um particular um, um monetary and financial processes that value a three-room bedroom apartment in berlin as a, at a certain price no matter what the architectural quality actually is yeah that that's a very important uh, point thank you so much for raising it because just 15 minutes <laughs> you you don't know uh, what to do with that because the it's kind of longer research. Uh, most of it comes from my, my previous research. And also, um, it, it, this is part of a work in progress uh, because of the group just choosing a speculation as a term. And uh, so I didn't have time to say that it's a very segmented uh, market, I think, uh, real estate. So you do have uh, both things happening. You have uh, one uh, segment in which uh, rent of form is used and very it's very important and you have another in which architecture architects are not even um, take part on it uh, or or they take part on it in a, in a very subordinate subordinate I don't know if you say that uh, way uh, for instance in this housing program here we had like four million houses being built in a few years what what uh, part architects really played uh, on it uh, we we have a we have an important experience uh, here of producing uh, so what we call social housing perhaps what you call mass housing i don't know what, how to call it anymore <laughs> now we have been discussing this terminology but anyway we have lots of uh, expertise and experience and interesting work of different kinds of architects but in the end uh, the, the developers decided uh, the form of 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 the just new settlements of 2000 houses sometimes by themselves with little participation from architects and sometimes even in the what uh, Sergio Ferro calls the, the narrow mass market because here the this is what you're saying this kind of a market that's big in Berlin it's small here because of rent inequality we have uh, that's the paradox we have a uh, a mass market, uh, real estate market that's very narrow because it's only the top of the pyramid uh, on the, of rent of the population, the rich, the wealthy, can access the formal real estate market. So then you have something like, as you describe uh, also, architects uh, play, have a role, but sometimes it's more like on the facade than really good design and something like that. So um, I would say that, uh, to put it short, that is kind of segmented, uh, segmented market. So when I was saying, when I was as, uh, as asking myself and also you, because I want the discussion question, uh, where does architecture, strictly speaking, come in? I was trying to say that in different ways related to, uh, to speculation. So it's in this kind of mass housing, having very difficult, uh, very hard time when we try to interfere. Uh, many architects that, do, that are not interested as well. So it's kind of battle in the, uh, what, what is architecture? 
uh, working with social housing, is it architecture? For, for some people, it's not. Because it, it, it's not that the exclusivity and singularity and so on, that is not that the author is not that much important. It's a collective, you do it with the workers, they can uh, interfere in, in the design and so on. So there is this way of relating to that. And then there are all the others. And the, the, the other extreme would be this, this rental form uh, that I was talking about uh, using uh, Pedro's book. I don't know if that. Uh, Respond to your question. I think I, I, I have to work more on that. My suggestion would be to move on to Francesco's presentation on lofts in China. And uh, so, sorry. some of these questions in light of Francesco's case study. So how, you know, how, what role does architecture and branding play in the market value of housing production in, in China? Does that, is that okay? Or did you, Francesco, did you have a question you wanted to ask before? Um, no, I just want to add to a little bit, uh, if I can, to this uh, discussion, because uh, I'm just to say that I'm very interested in this topic. And thank you, Marianne, to highlight also this relation between uh, production, uh, architecture as production, uh, and, uh, and the topic of, uh, of the brand. It is uh, something that uh, I, I researched for a lot of time. My doctoral dissertation was uh, about uh, the the housing the house uh, as a brand so it uh, was very close and uh, and so i, I just want uh, to ask you but you can also answer maybe later after my presentation so we can bring the discussion to another what do you mean by exclusivity um because uh, I, I think that uh, also it came out the relationship between the, the value or the role of architect in bringing in this uh, exclusivity. But uh, from my understanding, for instance, uh, I studied this, uh, this topic in China. It was not uh, only the, the name of the architect on bringing this uh, topic uh, of uh, exclusivity of, um, of the house, but more the name of the developer, for instance, or the strategy it uses uh, to to make uh, houses uh, uh, perceived more exclusive rather than they really are. So if then you can uh, add something to, to what you mean by this, uh, I would be very interested. Why don't I suggest we, we watch your presentation and then try yes. to discuss that question of exclusivity. Is it the, the name, is it the name brand of the architect? Is it actually the sort of cachet of the developer uh, in light of okay. that case study? Because I think that would be interesting. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much for the questions. Good afternoon, everyone. I focus my presentation on the term loft and how it has been used by China's real estate developers in their marketing tools. My choice of the term relies on its resonance in the Chinese contemporary real estate market and its impact in driving both the emergence of a new housing type and the lifestyle idea of housing developers. Literature in the field of architectural theory and practice has shown the definition of types and thus of the terms we use to describe the built and living environment is many times controversial. Morphological and typological traditions have restricted our epistemological understanding of the built environment to formal or use-based modes of classification. As the Italian architect Aldo Rossi argued, for instance, the type is a basic structure of the city as an urban artifact, and this is purely characterized by its predetermined formal and morphological features. By contrast, in this study, I posit that the dwelling type is not a given architectural metaphysical construct. Rather, I argue that it is a social spatial device which is socially constructed okay. from narratives and representations by whom are involved in the production and consumption of the built environment. In this view, a dwelling type is not an absolute nor immutable artifact in which people's lifestyles and mode of living historically change, as Rossi argued. Contrarily, in this paper, I display the double nature of the term loft as it has been exploited by China's real estate developers in their marketing tools to indicate both a housing type and a lifestyle. More specifically, I depict 
that in developers housing promotion strategies, the term loft surpasses its original meaning, a relatively large open space in multi-story industrial building or warehouses in the United States, but it exploits through specific and stereotyped architectural features, its symbolic value to connect with emerging lifestyle aspirations of some young Chinese creative professionals, not unless. In this manner, the contribution investigates how the definition of a housing type can be generated through a discourse established by those involved in the production of the built environment and the city, in this case, real estate developers. Moreover, the say argues that definition sometimes forced of a dwelling type can act as a mediator into the communication between housing suppliers and their possible customers, not only as an informative tool or a persuasive and rhetorical device, but also as a transformative force that shapes both architectural spaces and people's lifestyles. To date, many researchers and focus on the analysis of lifestyle patterns in housing choices, investment and related theories, as well as on how lifestyle ideas are used by real estate promoters to market their states. However, the relationship between lifestyle ideas of real estate investors and the spatial and material configuration of housing type has not been fully explored yet, and is particularly in the context of China's recent housing market development. This study combines architectural and spatial research with analysis of real estate advertisement content, particularly brochures, flyers, social media posts, web pages, illustrated hats, and posters were analyzed for free housing development by influential developers in China, namely Guangzhou Bank Cloud City, Shenzhen Bank Kim Metropolis, and Shenyang Golden Mai Plaza. All of these developments were built between 2007 and 2017, and the original advertising contained the term loft to indicate both a dwelling type and a lifestyle. Originally emerged in New York, loft became a marketable dwelling type in the context of 1970s deindustrialization. By early 2000s, geographies of lofts expanded to many contexts and to several types of buildings. They comprise both the reuse of former factories, but also offices, schools, and even churches. Under China advanced capitalism, a subtle idea of loft living associated to specific types of habitation recently emerged in developers' discourses to market their states in city centers and central business districts of major Chinese metropolis, which were transitioning from hard industrial centers to creative and service-oriented clusters. The recent expansion of the Chinese city was the result of a large urbanization process and the rapid growth of new urban inhabitants. Subsequently, housing markets need to react up rapidly, increasing demand in various areas, from studio apartments to family dwelling, and also regeneration of central urban areas. In China, the idea of loft should be contextualized in such a dynamic and maturing market environment, which requires continued development of new dwelling forms and marketing tools. Differently from geographies of loft living emerged in the fate of industrial properties and the impacts of adaptive reuse, in China, loft living was primarily associated to brand new construction. More precisely, the term loft has been imported in China since the mid of the 2000s. However, its radical diffusion is more up to date. Differently from many foreign words, Loft is usually not translated according to its meaning, such as it has been for townhouses, country houses, urban villas, and other common words in real estate advertising. Rather, it is a popular term that may come buyers aspirate to certain urban imagery and appreciate its international origin. From an epistemological perspective, the elements that compose a dwelling type can be thus retrieved from empirical observation of urban spaces together with the social descriptions and representations. 
The spatial analysis of three selected case studies reveals some common features that from understanding characterize what Chinese real estate developers usually name loft. Most of the time, loft apartments are situated in urban spaces that are promoted as vibrant and dynamic. In China, they include both the revitalization of central business districts in city core and new built areas with financial, technological, or creative vocations. Usually, loft apartments are arranged side by side and are often served by an external gallery that connects all the apartments to a vertical distribution. Loft apartments are often configured in linear or Cartier buildings. Each apartment features a rectangular floor plan, typically half or a third as wide as its zip. Because of their disposition in the building, only the shore side is naturally illuminated. The total floor area of the unit rarely exceeds 80 or 90 square meters. Loft is a dwelling type on two floors, characterized by a minimalist large open floor plan, except for the bathroom. Half of it is composed by a small entrance with a closet and a kitchen counter on the left and a bathroom door on the opposite side. The kitchen area, which is very small and features a minimal equipment, is not closed, clearly reflecting a lifestyle of young middle-class people focused on working and dining outside the home. The second half of the entry-level floor is usually a large and rectangular space with large windows on the front. The space is a multifunctional one since it serves as a dining room, a living room and a workspace. It is double A, thus permitted to enlarge further the dimension of the frontal window, which is a particular trait intended to recall the imagery of the original loft. A small steep stair on the one side connects the first floor with the sleeping area, which is situated in a mezzanine, sometimes facing directly on the living room. It accommodates a bed, a desk and a closet. The whole environment composed of one open space dedicated to both daily living and sleeping hardly reflects the needs for a family home, but instead serves as a place for both working, relaxing and hosting friends. Most of loft apartments I analyzed are dominated by a minimal design and a strong contemporary appearance. The decoration, usually very light and simple, is composed by a mix of white plastered or red brick walls, wooden floors and steel frames. Generally, the interior style either follows a modern industrial design language or modern oriental ornamentation. Model houses are furnished with simple Nordic style sofas, tables and TV stands or eccentric industrial style pieces. With their seminal book Loft Living, Sharon Zukin set a precedent not only for discussing lofts as an emerging dwelling type, but also in indicating lifestyles as a relevant subject of investigation in housing and urban studies. From the time, many researchers focus on the analysis of lifestyle patterns in housing choices, investments related theories, as well as on how lifestyle ideas are used by real estate promoters to market their products. The concept of lifestyle has grown in importance in the social science fields since it became the basic framework to express an individual world way of living as well as an expression of social affiliation and distinctions. In this study, I assume that real estate developers manage lifestyle ideas through imagery and contributed forms to make housing consumers identify themselves with certain living conditions and express their status of belonging. Marketing materials directly talk to potential home buyers about lifestyles, communicating to them how the life in loft apartments should be. Methods to analyze lifestyle patterns abound in recent sociologic, consumer and marketing literature. To operationalize my analysis, I adopt the framework indicated by Chris and Scholz that permits to 
frame key concept of advertising documents along the human matrices of lifestyle composed by both demographic and socioeconomic information and cognitive behavior as ones. Key concepts have been identified and listed in the table. Promotional materials target potential middle class and buyers, including white collars, workers, young entrepreneurs and professionals. However, China's middle class is quite heterogeneous. Some authors such as Zhang prefer to talk of middle classes instead of a unique social group. When trying to identify lifestyle characteristics of loft home buyers, as they were explicated in loft real estate advertisements, it is probably more appropriate to refer to what Richard Florida defined as a creative middle class, namely the social group which members engage in work whose function is to create meaningful new forms. According to Florida definition, the creative middle class includes scientists and engineers, software programmers, university professors, novelists, artists, entertainers, designers and architects, among many others. However, the idea of creative class goes behind a mere occupational definition. Generally, it provides a definition for people that are interested in arts, culture and science, not only for professional scopes, but also to mark a status or a way of life. Fine taste, art inspiration are indeed marketing rhetorics in many loft housing promotion. In terms of households, loft advertisement mostly solicited singles or couples. In terms of demographics, developers target mostly young people between 25 and 45 years old, to the point that some advertising slogan explicitly adopt terms such as youngsters and modern young people in their communication. In the stage of life, housing choices are mostly driven by career opportunities rather than family needs. The option for home office work is also an argument explicated in some tenants' brochures. It is clear that all these traits align the pursuit of a new lifestyle by those middle classes which, according to Zukin, are composed by men and women who live near work and other single people that seem to be enthused about the vitality of urban life. Indeed, proximity to workplaces, bars, cultures and shopping centers, museum galleries, public transportation routes and other urban activities is a selling argument of all analyzed advertisements. Accordingly, cultural activities that are promoted and sponsored by developers comprehend music or art festivals, networking events, and generally activities that aim at seducing young people fascinating by a high dynamic urban environment. All of these advertisements tend to refer strongly to the idea of artistic intellectual temper, high level careers of being and self-realization, and of seeking relaxation and enjoyment in one's domestic environment. This empirical research that picks the, the terms loft has gained a certain relevance in today's China's housing market, particularly for what concerns marketing purposes. Geographies of loft living and their marketing significance have been recognized in many countries and contexts. This paper adds to, pre to previous studies by discussing how ideas of loft has been translated in China, applied to brand new construction and sold to Chinese home buyers. The article displayed the double nature of the term loft as it has been exploited by real estate developers to indicate both a dwelling type and a lifestyle. In this manner, a further conjecture has been made between architecture design and how it is narrated by whom are structurally involved in this production and consumption. It is an argument that on the one hand, real estate developers know that Chinese consumers might be fascinated by the term loft to, rec to recall imageries of urban, exciting and juvenile living environment in large global cities in the West. On the other hand, real estate developers contributed defining the meaning of living in a loft, communicating potential consumers how the loft in 
love living mark and development should be. Authors such as Fletcher state that to choose a house is to choose a lifestyle, and on this I cannot agree more. However, as shown in this article, choosing a lifestyle is also choosing a dwelling type that seem, tamer, that seem tailored for a specific way of living. In this context, housing design revealed itself part as a developer's marketing strategy. Design features of brand new apartments are shaping around the idea of how loft living is imagined and stereotyped by real estate developers. Special design features in this sense are not neutral, not only they are suited for, but also they convey mode of living which implicates broad sociocultural transformations. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Francesco. I, I also realize I forgot to introduce you, which I'll do now. Francesco um, is currently a postdoc research fellow at the Inter-University Department of Regional and Urban Studies um, and Planning uh, and a member of the China Room Research Group at the Politecnico di Torino. Uh, he received his PhD last year at the Politecnico di Torino and it's titled China Brand Homes. So we just, I think, saw some key insights from that research, I imagine. Um, so thank you so much for this um, overview through one type of discourse and type in the relationship of type really and social identity or the construction of social identity and what you're showing us. I don't think this, this is a new thing. And I think we, we discussed this a little bit in, in the paper that housing types have always been associated with certain mode of living. Interesting here is that it's, it's, let's say, not so much the citizen that's being shaped, but the consumer, right? So there's a, there's a, the consumer comes in and not so much the, 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 the housing type as a form for the state, let's say, to advocate a certain ideal citizen. So, um, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for this. I'd like to open this up. So uh, maybe all open questions, and maybe we can also discuss this in light of what was just asked before. Uh, the role of exclusivity, what, what actually is exclusive and how does that play into to marketing both type and lifestyle? I can um, jump in with a small question. Um, Francesco, thank you so much for your fascinating talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, some of the his, uh, historical and transcultural associations that you brought up at the beginning, um, whether or not this is understood as a particularly American um, history that's being referred to, or, or, or is it really about a kind of contemporary lifestyle? Um, if you could speak a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, so. What, what I was to express in the, in the start of the presentation was uh, about also the, uh, the migration of, uh, of models, but also of words. So, and, and this uh, for me related also the, the terms uh, and, uh, and the housing features, the architectural features uh, of, uh, of a type, for instance, um, because uh, yeah, the term loft origin in the, in the US, uh, but then uh, I believe uh, it it migrates uh, around the, the world. Um, but actually, um, it was uh, mainly referred to 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 the regeneration of industrial buildings, such as that loft uh, indicate uh, as a term uh, the the regeneration of itself uh, or uh, a new. Uh, or uh, a housing that uh, a residential type that is uh, that comes from a regeneration of an industrial building, but uh, throughout this migration, uh, I understood uh, how it uh, it went to China, and it, when it went to China, but probably also in other parts of the world, uh, it became also associated to brand new construction. So it uh, it changed also the the meaning of the word while uh, it was changing also the, the type uh, of architecture, the, the, made, uh, the, the way it was made. So this, I don't know if I answer your question, but uh, this was uh, the, the beginning of the presentation, the meaning of uh, the beginning. I guess just one more clarification. Does it still have any particular, is it, is it a kind of um, um, 
a kind of amorphous term right now, or does it have a kind of, still retain a, a particular association with uh, with American capitalism, or or it has it kind of turned global? Yeah, I think now it became a, a global term, and this uh, is a, it is what interesting. But also, I think it is it is interesting that it became a, a common term, so not only used. Uh, for instance, in the field uh, of, uh, of architecture or in the discourses uh, of uh, academics uh, and so on. But uh, actually, uh, it became a, a common term that is used in the public discourse. So it is used uh, by real estate developers uh, to market uh, their, uh, their products, but also in this way, it uh, indicates, uh, it uh, remind a, a certain imagery, a certain uh, way of living uh, uh, that uh, arise uh, before uh, in that context uh, of the United States. So I, I think that uh, it is used by real estate developers, for instance, so that consumers can uh, imagine to, to living in the New York of the 1970s, for instance. So that, uh, that's, I think it's interesting that is the word itself that uh, that bring this meaning. Thank you. Can I follow up on the exclusivity question? I mean, the, the way you're showing it is that it's it's a it's a type. It's fairly standard. They might vary. the The apartments might vary in size, but they're all they're, they're all basically the same. So how would you how would you argue then, or would you argue that exclusivity plays a plays a big role here, or is it actually in fact the generic the genericness of the modern modernity of the loft that is actually what's what's providing the cachet or the status of, of moving into a loft like do is there really a difference between these products or ultimately they work because everybody knows what a loft is okay so, sorry susan i miss uh, the the first uh, the first part of your question is there, we... is this assuming that these are successful successful in the sense yes. that they're they're selling or they're renting okay um how much of that is due to what you asked before in terms of exclusivity each one of these developments has a very you know has its own name has its own sort of brand and status and yes how much is due to the fact that everybody now knows what a loft is everybody knows what to expect it's sort of the same it's exactly the same layout over and over and over again so how much is how much do you think the success is due to actually uh, a, the type the genericness of the type and the association and how much is due to exclusivity which i would say exclusivity has something to do with uniqueness yeah i, I think they they are brand uh, as a ex exclusive one uh, with another but actually what uh, i understood uh, is that when developers use the term loft, so when they attach the term loft to their communication, is actually because they are referring to a type that, uh, that is the one that I try to describe. And then, uh, obviously, the, the type is then developed, is then, uh, um, is then developed in, in different banners uh, when uh, it's brought to, to reality. But, uh, for instance, from my understanding, uh, um, when we talk about the uh, exclusivity of uh, one of these uh, uh, houses uh, conceived uh, as brand with another, is also the name of the developer itself uh, that make this uh, exclusiveness. Uh, this uh, I refer to to my broader research uh, uh, that was uh, about the, the brand homes. Um, and what I understood from that, it was that uh, as in, in the goods market, uh, uh, and, and before Mariana was making this, uh, this uh, relationship between uh, uh, market, between goods that are uh, marketed as brand and, uh, and the housing, and, uh, and so also the name of the builder, the name of the developer itself, uh, mark uh, the, the house that make uh, it more exclusive uh, or not. For instance, uh, I cited uh, one of these developers, Wang Ke, that is uh, a very large uh, developer uh, in China, and uh, it made uh, itself uh, a brand like, uh, I don't know, Gucci, I, I don't know, uh, or uh, for uh, for for shoes uh, or uh, 
or uh, and so I think that uh, it's also a part uh, um, important in making uh, exclusive uh, housing or not. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I was just I, I I wrote in the can, can I say was there some someone else before me? No, I didn't see anyone. Um, uh, so, I, I'm uh, now. I, I wrote sorry it's a longer passage you don't have to read it right now it's just that uh, it's uh, it's the part of in the paper in which I mentioned the term uh, that you asked about uh, the rental form and then I put the reference of, of the book uh, so the word was more exceptionality and uh, perhaps not exclusivity but uh, anyway the, the later we used the other one and exclusivity also I think it's as I was trying to respond to Anna, there are different kinds of um, connections I think we can make uh, with the role of architecture and architects on, uh, on all of this kind of monopoly game of uh, production as production as CG, uh, risk game and, and uh, one of them is like this kind of Pritzker Prize uh, architects, uh, prize architects and uh, that uh, really have the power of producing something that is considered exceptional. I'm not even saying that it is exceptional, but it's advertised as exceptional. It's in the, in the magazine, it's displayed as, as well. And then you also have uh, others that are more expert on producing this kind of uh, homogeneity, but that has some kind, any kind of thing that can add a little bit on that. So I think you're absolutely right that it's kind of if you advertise it as a loft, it's a kind of homogenization process because people know what to expect. So you have this kind of um, tension and connections between uh, differentiation and homogenization at the same time happening in the expansion of, of real estate. It has to create differences, but it also has to look the same somehow. So that kind of interaction that interests me too to discuss uh, and to understand. And also, there is another important role of architecture uh, uh, that um, uh, is designing things that will never be built. And uh, I have an example of that later, if we have time, I can uh, display that to you, but it is kind of drawings that are made to show what's going to happen to this area if we approve, for instance, some kind of uh, land use change. That's very common, you know, this kind of, uh, work uh, then uh, if you if you show people if you that you have this possibility of this coming as a future for this part of the city so it gives the right to some kind of interest uh, people to to appropriate it but we perhaps we can discuss that later i'd just like to finish with a suggestion i don't know if francesco know it it's a documentary movie on china real estate bubble it's uh, called the dream empire no, I have never seen it, but uh... it, it, it's very interesting because it's a, it's a student, uh, I think demography, he, he goes there to study what's going on uh, and then uh, he, he got a job and his job is to stand in front of the new buildings dressed in a way that it looks as if it is kind of Western culture or something that like that. And then he realizes that what he's part of the real estate bubble and so on but it's it's an interesting movie i think the this dissertation was at cooney in, in new york i talked to him i interviewed him because i discussed his movie once in a show thank you very much i think he's available if you want to talk to him as well dave de is his so name. i think i would like to keep it moving so everybody has about half an hour um and i think it's actually a fantastic transition to raquel's work on the fox mono which is a similar kind of type uh, and a similar kind of uh, standardization and question of what the standards are. How do you how do you design this thing? Um, maybe not so much for uh, um, a lifestyle of the new creative class, but definitely the creation of the the model citizen. I would say. So um, I'm I'm very I'm actually propaganda or advertising. You know, that's a I was fantasizing of pulling together some of those posters from the 1930s with some of the, you know the strong men with the beautiful women, like what, you know, it's, it's similarly promoting a, not, again, not just a lifestyle, but a, a notion of citizenship and, and role of, and, and identity. So I think 
some of these things um, connect very, very much across time and place and through housing. So um, are there any immediate questions for Raquel? If not, let's go to Nimrod. I'm very happy that we have a practicing architect um, in the group. Um, or let's say most of the time is a practicing architect. Um, uh, he's not just an architect, but a product designer and currently works with Potash Architects. Um, he received his Bachelor of Architecture from Technion and in recent years has taken part in several social struggles regarding the built environment. And hopefully you will tell us more about that as well and picking up on the opening conversation about how to connect discourse in the academy with discourse of uh, not just a profession, but activism or a political struggle beyond. So um, I'm going to pass on to Nimrod. The meaning of universal is fit to all or good for all. This seemingly positive attribute was attacked in the postmodern age as a bad compromise that shadows the human endeavor and decreases the quality of life. In architecture, the criticism was concentrated on the repetitive housing law. I think that we, maybe not innocently, misinterpreted the universalism meaning. A universal design is good for all only when it is both accessible to all and benefits all. Therefore, the rejection of the universal means less for more or more for less people, that is. This can be seen dramatically in the housing market of the last, last decades in many parts of the world. This raises the question, can we design housing projects that will be affordable to every citizen in the country and yet be high quality and flexible enough to fit their needs? This is a difficult question as even affordable housing, as it's called, is not accessible to the lower income households. I plan to show that by using modern modular construction systems that are widely available today, we can achieve a universal design that is both flexible and high quality. My project is a proof of concept to that effect. Payment capabilities calculations of current rent control tenants in Israel shows that a 200,000 shekels or $60,000 apartment is a universally affordable price for a 60 square meters apartment. The market value of such an apartment is in the vicinity of 1 million shekels or $300,000. That price can be split into three main parts, land, taxing and construction. In Israel, the land is almost completely state-owned so in many ways, the cost of leasing the land for housing is an anti-progressive taxing system. It accounts for around 3% of the annual budget. Traditionally, public housing would have been the answer for this institutional inequality. Unfortunately, public housing, once a private institution in Israel, dwindles so much that the waiting period can take more than 20 years. Sadly, right now, the public sentiment in Israel doesn't allow for a reconstitution of the Public Housing Institute. From that perspective, I suggest land and development taxes to be unified and to be applied in a progressive manner. Using a joint ownership system similar to the ones used by some municipalities in Australia and the UK, the state can lease the land in a progressive manner, enabling lower income households to own a house under some limitations. For example, protection from scalping and limitations on private transportation like in public housing. This put the construction cost as the main barrier for house ownership. A housing solution that will surpass this barrier can be called borrowing from universal design, universal housing. Even though this can be seen as a solution aimed at the most lower income households, it is a good solution for many higher income households as well, making it a sort of carb cutting of the housing market. After a long research on the subject, I found that the best way to achieve this goal is by using assembly architecture. Because it was perceived as the most powerful way for cost reduction and increased build quality, 
Assembly architecture for housing has been an aspiration of architects from the beginning of the modern age. Architects like Gropius and Jean Prouvé have taken great strides in its implementation, but it has failed to fulfill its potential and remained a side note in the architectural discipline. In spite of that, recent years' developments in manufacturing capabilities and computer aided design are bringing back to the front of the architecture discourse. Universal design and assembly architecture raise several challenges and opportunities. The challenge of original design, the challenge of effective and efficient communication with the assemblers, and the opportunities for the above mentions considerable cost and waste reductions. In this theoretical project, I try to tackle these issues by reaching outside of the regular architecture realm and incorporating disciplines from product design and electronics manufacturing. The main differences of assembly architecture as I implemented it from regular architecture are a real scale model of the building is required Construction and finish systems are limited to dry assembly only, with exception due to code. Precise bill of materials with no hidden costs. Communication with assemblers must be simple as IKEA instructions. And architectural elements are interchangeable, allowing for variations in the design. These changes are derived from experience I had working as a product designer and are similar to practices common in the consumer electronics industry. Their purpose is to ensure the product will be cost effective and fast to assemble. As I mentioned before, this is not a new line of thinking. The self and house designed by Kieran Timberlake, for example, has taken assembly architecture to its fullest potential. The main challenge on my part was to show that this is not only a theoretical exercise but a viable solution for universal housing available right now in Israel without massive investment in assembly lines or the usage of expensive material. For those reasons, the systems I chose to implement was a light gauge seal with insulated metal panel systems. Unlike most other construction systems used in Israel, it is completely dry assembly system and is perfectly for assembly architecture. It is also one of the lower cost construction systems in the country. The system was used successfully in the tin house designed by Raza Gilboa with almost half the construction cost of the average Israeli house. The project contains 36 60 square meters two bedroom apartments in six floors and an additional space in the ground floor that can be additional apartments and or public or commercial spaces. In each floor there is a bomb shelter as required by Israeli law. The shelters may function as additional flex space for the tenants as home office, a teenager living unit or storage. Additionally, access to the roof allows a communal space to be developed. There are no parking on site to reduce costs and as part of a concessions for land subsidations. The project topology was a big issue in the design. For cost reduction, I chose to build a bomb shelter for each floor and not for each apartment as is common. This suggested a linear topology that allowed each apartment access. Early attempts with open pathways based design were rejected by people as they conflict with privacy issues. Finally, I chose a topology based on a partly open central pathway with apartments and facilities like stairs and shelters trimmed along it. This topology allows for a flexible number of apartments per floor as can be seen in the seams attached. The construction was mainly designed from luggage steel the only parts of the project designed to be built from reinforced concrete are the ground floor and the shelters as required by building code. The rest of the building elements follow suit with easy installation materials like gypsum, plywood and fiber cement boards. In order to reduce costs, no floor and bathroom finishes are provided. Water sealing paint is used instead. 
In this project, I tried to adhere to the current Israeli housing design style. The point was not to push the boundaries on areas like housing typology, but to provide a proof of concept for an affordable housing design. The staggering windows were chosen to provide a modern and non-repetitive feel to the design. And every apartment received a big recessed balcony with a plausible service niche. The house is very well insulated so no air conditioning is included, but can be easily installed. The interior design is very simple, consisting of an open kitchen and living room and an efficient two-bedroom living wing, a very common layout in Israeli houses. The only exception is the use of plywood sheets for the ceiling in order to reduce working costs on ceiling finishes and to give warmth to the design. One of the main issues that rises from the Universal Assembly architecture is the issue of design flexibility and the unseen costs that allow it. When we hear the word assembly, we think of the Ford assembly line. We think of a lot of cheap, identical products produced in high quantities. In the architectural theme, industrial architecture is synonymous with repetitive dreary buildings. But if you ask children what they think when they hear the word assembly, and they will think of Lego, a game synonymous with endless possibilities and creativity. In that way, universal housing design is an opportunity for more individual as well as accessible architecture. As it is, assembly architecture housing is more like the special Legos with a lot of one-off parts. Nevertheless, it still allows enough flexibility to achieve uniqueness. The interchangeability of parts gives almost limitless possibilities for individual changes in the apartments. The lighted steel construction method is highly computerized and allows for very fast assembly of wall parts in the factory. This allows for a lot of flexibility in the location of openings without sacrificing construction costs. Continuing this way of thinking, the rest of the construction elements were to be pre-cut and supplied to site in kits for fast assembly. As the tools necessary for the whole construction, except the reinforced concrete part, are an electric screwdriver, a ceiling gun, an exacto knife, and a paint roller, the assembly is fast and requires small amounts of construction expertise from the builders. It is also less physically taxing work, encouraging the participation of local workers. These industrialized construction methods does allow a lot of design flexibility, but requires a lot of pre-collaborations of both the design software and the building elements production line. In order for this design method to work in reasonable timetables and costs, there is a need for design recipes that will balance the need for flexibility and cost. In the common years, we as architects and citizens will have to decide whether we are accepting the current states of housing or will we take radical solutions, both politically and professionally. I don't suggest this is the only or best solution, but I do think that the more solutions like this are out to the public, the closer we will come to better housing for everyone. As for the architectural field, imagining a future where the assembly architecture method is prevalent does imply a shift in the role of the architect, at least in housing. Designing a real scale model requires a big investment and in specialized models that allow fast implementation of the design to changing situations. This can lead to cut and paste architecture and even with very flexible recipes may cause stagnation repetitions, although not so different from the current design scale of modern Israeli housing. As I see it, the actual field will have to transform to something similar to what happened to the fashion industry. Meaning, the majority of architects will create collections that will be beam recipes for housing. These recipes will be implemented in housing projects while the main design team will work on next year collection. Of course, like fashion, there will always remain a place for tailor-made architecture but the main volume will have to move to assembly method if we intend to rise to the challenge of affordable universal housing. In conclusion, 
Following this methodology should result in high quality, low cost, and with the right architectural design, beautiful, accommodating housing. It does require architects to leave the custom built solutions and start finding the opportunities within the limitations. Thank you. Thank you, Nimrod. Thankful to watch. <laughs> what do we think? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask the first question. Why, why isn't it happening? What's, what's, keeping, what's keeping these ideas from being implemented? Did you say something? I didn't hear it. Sorry, I'll say it again. Um, what's, so thank you very much um, for putting an actual proposal um, on the table. Um, what is keeping this proposal, and I'm sure there are many like it, not to say that this isn't unique, but um, you know, as you said, this isn't the first time this has been proposed. Mm. Why, why, why isn't it why? Um, why do we need to change? Yeah, I think the main issue, and I, I think I just, I cut a small part of my lecture by mistake. Um, the, the view is of land as taxation in Israel, I think is very important because uh, due to the fact that the land is, is mostly state owned, uh, seeing it as a private, um, uh, thing, private, um, <laughs> forgot the word, um, asset, asset, yeah, sorry, a private asset to, to be used by companies is a mistake because they're just scalping the, the profits out of the, the state. The state tries to Basically, almost half the uh, three percent of the state uh, tax revenue comes from leasing land. But they the lease the land not directly. Hmm? Say the number again. How, percentage. Uh, it's almost almost uh, ten billion dollar. It can it can vary. For example, in recent year there was like a reform in in land taxation in land uh, prices. And there was a big uh, problem with uh, revenue from taxation because they didn't have that money. So they had like around three billion uh, uh, deficit from it. Uh, so in, they, 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 they hmm? in general, so, percentage, more or less, you're saying total state revenue, how much of that is from the land? Uh, roughly nine, 10 billion uh, shekels each year, which is around 3% of the... 3. 3 percent, yeah. So it's not huge, but it's important because uh, it, it was uh, an important uh, change in the, in the total uh, revenue. And the fact is, the, the way they do it is by uh, selling, it's not really selling, but leasing the land for big companies in huge chunks, and then these companies develop it. They also do it for uh, private citizens, uh, usually in the periphery with, uh, pri for private homes, but that's not the, uh, it's not for uh, mass construction. This is only for uh, private residence and uh, the thing is if we, if we look at it as a as a, a, a asset that belongs to the people and we say well let us lease it directly from the government then you have the construction cost as the only barrier for, uh, for home ownership. And then these kind of projects that uh, treat costs of, of construction are relevant. Otherwise, the, the gap between the prices of land and uh, the price of home are so big, the price of construction are so big that uh, 
it's almost irrelevant. So without a political stand, this project is not, not really relevant. I think the, the main reason I did prefer to do it is because um, it give a, a tangible uh, feel or tangible uh, part for the persuasion, for the, for the argument. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't speak English for a long time. <laughs> no, perfect. Um, no, I mean, I think that's a, that even that is a, a, a key argument that isn't often made, which is to say in a, a certain architectural proposal um, needs a political framework. I mean, I, I think architects don't often think in those terms, and I think that's so basic maybe here in this conversation that we forget to say, but that's your answer to my question was that it's, it's only feasible if. So we have to also address yes. that if. Uh, I'm opening the microphone to anyone, so please. Well, I guess I, what, what's the name for your, pro oh, I guess you do have a name. It's universal housing, right? That would, that's how you. Yeah, well, yeah, it had a different name, but, uh... I was aiming for uh, um, almost half the price in the beginning, so I call it 100 by 100, but uh, it wasn't possible, so... <laughs> the universal housing, yeah. yeah can I ask about, uh, to, to deepen this, uh, this topic of the universality, and so mm -hmm. do, do you think that uh, this uh, housing typology uh, can be scattered uh, all over the world or it's uh, specific uh, for uh, for israel i understood perfectly that from the point of view of the financial liaison uh, of the operation and uh, of the of the land is uh, strictly specific uh, to the country even if uh, yeah. for instance in china is very similar the system that you discussed so but uh, however but from the point of view of the architectural solution uh, do you think it it's something that, uh, that has some features uh, specifically related uh, to the country or uh, it can be made? Uh, yeah, I, I think it can be. I'm not sure that the design I did is specifically good or bad uh, comparatively to other designs. But um, I, I think that Israeli design is very, very international. Uh, it, it's also called the international style. So it was born from the Bauhaus and international style and it remained international in its core and very influenced from other countries. Uh, so I would say in, in many ways it's kind of vanilla international style in that regard. Um, I, I cannot, I, I try to do this design uh, less avant-garde in, in this regard uh, and more the, more close to the common uh, uh, design scape in Israel uh, as best as I could. Um, I, I cannot answer about other countries because I don't know their design scape that well. I think there is importance when you make a very uh, affordable product to not make it, um, to make it something that people will connect uh, to uh, emotionally and won't feel they are in the middle of an experiment. So that was my point of view. Okay. Thank you. My question was also related. Oh, sorry. Please, please, Brigitte. No, no, okay. My question was also related to the to the method of production. Uh, if they were uh, specific, specifically uh, thought for, uh, because for instance, I, I know of some uh, prefabrication uh, um, models uh, in uh, in China that are uh, very different. So 
because uh, uh, the the China housing constructions uh, uh, is mainly based uh, on concrete um, rather than, for instance, uh, steel construction. And so there are developers in China that uh, uh, develop strong uh, uh, strategies uh, of uh, prefabrication uh, of uh, housing, but based uh, on uh, on concrete elements uh, rather than uh, other technologies, and, and that was uh, mainly related also to the to the logics uh, and to the um, of the construction industry in uh, in the country. So there was something specific in a certain way that bring to some choices rather than others. So it is. Why I was uh, wondering if yeah, uh, uh, the, the, that's uh, that's an, a good a good uh, point. Uh, this is not an Israeli uh, kind of construction. Israel is mostly concrete and blocks and concrete blocks. Uh, the reason I did choose this method is um, that concrete uh, type uh, fabrication tends to need really uh, huge uh, facilities and to be very regular. So it's uh, usually used for uh, fabrication of uh, really large neighborhoods in one go. So you make a, a, a concrete plant specific for this neighborhood and you fabricate for this neighborhood. Um, and this is all this, this will make the, the thing I want to avoid, which is the mass building of, uh, of a cookie cutter, uh, cookie cutter architecture. Um, and this method is very computerized. Uh, it doesn't require huge plants. Uh, it's available in Israel. There are other methods that are probably quite as good, but are not available in Israel. Uh, so these are the reasons. But um, yeah, but it was not only because it's available in Israel, but also because of its flexibility and uh, availability as a one-off even. It, it's flexibility also in, in availability in uh, quantities. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Priscilla. Thank you, thank you, Nimrod. And, and I, I wanted to, you know, preface that I, I found the, 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 uh, pro the proposal um, very uh, uh, beautiful and um, uh, like the design very beautiful. And, uh, and almost like Ikea, you go to Ikea and you buy your house and you come and you assemble your house, which is really, you know, this idea that you, you yeah, you industrialize production. But we've also mm -hmm. been discussing that a house is not like a car or like a like a, 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 a dress like a um, dress or clothing like you you were saying so but so the point is and i apologize because my internet is really awful so i keep losing like the key explanations so could you explain again uh, how would you deal with land because i think that the the your key the key uh, yeah. in any any prefabrication and and universal housing solution is land. Like in the in the favelas of Brazil, there's lots of solutions for uh, beautiful prefab that never go forward. And we, and, and Mariana, myself, many scholars think it's like it's the land issue that you know it's not yes. provided. So could you explain again? I'm sorry. How uh, what, how do you solve the land issue? Exactly. Exactly. The, the land issue, well, it's a two parts, but the land issue is probably the bigger part. Um, the thing is, the point is, and it's different in different countries, in Israel, uh, almost all the land is uh, state-owned. Uh, so the point is to pressure the government to allow people to uh, lease land not in one go, like you pay a big chunk of money and you get the land, but in both uh, um, incremental and to view it as a tax, okay? And as, as a tax which is anti-progressive. 
because the rich pay less than the poor. And uh, if we say it like that and we say, okay, all the development taxes and the cost of land, we unify them to, to land ownership tax, and then we can make it a progressive tax. So instead of giving uh, families money to rent apartments, we're saying, okay, you, you get a discount uh, according to your uh, situation. So uh, if you are a, a single mother without a job, then you pay almost nothing. And then the cost of this kind of uh, apartment which is, uh, if, if you take about a loan from the bank with uh, state help, it's around 700, 800 shekels, it's around $200, I think, a month, which is uh, 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 affordable for even people without income in Israel. Uh, and the point is, the more, the more income you have, the more you pay the land tax and until you reach a point in which it costs you more to live in this kind of, uh, of houses than in the private sector. Can, can I add? Can I comment? Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a provocative comment because I'm very interested in this, uh, this discussion. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, but fr from my experience, uh, both uh, in, in practice, but also in, in studying this, this process uh, um, in China, but also as well, um, actually, um, the, one of the reasons because uh, the, the government, uh, for example, in China, leases the land to, to private developers, and particularly large groups, uh, mm -hmm. actually in China, uh, there is uh, also a, an urban morphology made of uh, of super blocks, so um, actually yes, they are financialization of big operation is because they try to, to limit the risk of the investment and also to provide a sort of uh, financialization uh, throughout these uh, enterprises, uh, also to cover the cost of infrastructures uh, and uh, and so on. So it's uh, uh, it's a way to have the the money in the first start and, and to start doing uh, streets uh, and, uh, and everything. So how do you think uh, the, the system you are proposing uh, uh, can, uh, can also respond to the need of uh, infrastructure that can prepare the site uh, and, and so on? Yeah, it, it's very simple. In, in the last three or four decades, there is a constant decrease in uh, income tax in the Western countries and a constant increase in uh, other taxes, uh, mostly not -prog progressive taxes. And uh, <laughs> the point is, is to reverse the process. You need to get, to get more income tax and, you, and then you can pay for these things like they did before. So, the problem right now that I think is more of a perception problem than a, a policy problem. Because policies can be different. You, you could go to public housing like they did before, right? But perception in the public sees this as a wasteful. I think it's connected very much to what uh, for the dissertation by Susanna. Uh, the perception is that if you do it in a public way is wasteful and if you do it in a private way is uh, more sound, financially sound. But uh, the tax that is uh, put on the society is hidden. Okay, it's hidden through the economic process of, uh, of a financialization of the land. So my proposal is to, uh, to show uh, the gap, okay? The point of this project is to show the gap. This is how much it costs, it really costs to make a building. And the rest is taxation. So, okay, you tax me, I want a tax reduction. You can tax, you can tax the, the income instead. 
Um, this is a polit political stance, but I think it has uh, a power in, in the political structure that we are in it today. I would think it's a, it's a fascinating challenge to use a proposal, which it's beautiful, it's Ikea. It, it's not very revolutionary, right? It's two bedroom apartments, six floors. Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of buildings in Israel that look more or less like this. But to use that to then open up a discussion about all the things that we don't see. Yeah. So I think it would be great. I'm very curious to see how you take this forward to really um, use the architecture as a, as a hook to explain what is going on. Um, yeah, uh, I think it was supposed to start. I was supposed to start the process uh, and then the coronavirus struck. <laughs> well, everything I mean, got freeze. This even more urgent or the audience more yeah. for this. I mean, I think also the issue of taxation is interesting because, you know, you say, well, this will do without parking, which is probably for most people only feasible if there's a, actually a way of getting around another way of getting yeah. around. You know, so it's, you're sort of editing out some of those most contentious issues and <laughs> yeah. the desirability of, of let's say the, the consumer's perspective and the feasibility. People have to get to work, people have to get to school. Yeah, it, it needs to be close to, to public so, transportation. So I think, you know, linking that again then to this broader universal conversation of how, you know, it goes beyond the building itself um, could be interesting. So um, I would like Raquel to comment, given Raquel's um, deep knowledge on prefabrication, trying to build housing for lo low, at, you know, available at lower prices, affordable to lower incomes. You, 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 know, you, gave, us, you gave us the images of what Nimrod was talking about, Gropius, the, the debates uh, in Weissenhof. What, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, it was uh, meant to be a way to reduce costs and to give that benefit to the consumer. So at the end, the problem was basically rents, the rental payment that it was uh, simply uh, unaccessible to most of the population. So in the case of Cropius, it was very interesting that uh, he privileged the idea of experimenting with uh, technology instead of focusing on saving money. And uh, in, in the case of uh, this, uh, a housing estate uh, in Turten, down of uh, Dessau, uh, uh, south of Dessau. Uh, the entire issue was exactly that, that uh, he was using municipal uh, money and uh, he had to just uh, make uh, housing affordable. And at the end, he preferred to experiment with technology and create uh, this kind of uh, uh, houses that were like 128 square meters, that uh, for a, a the worker, it was absolutely impossible to pay that kind of rent. And uh, that was exactly the discussion. And uh, at the end, that was the main issue that uh, triggered his uh, resignation from the Bauhaus because although it was an independent commission for Gropius that was not pre properly related to the Bauhaus, for the entire town it was uh, related as well. And uh, the fact that uh, they were unable to pay the rents for those uh, houses, it was uh, a big, big issue. The other issue, it, it was that uh, the technology was not good enough. So they had plenty of uh, leaks in, in the houses and uh, it was uh, just uh, a technical issue that uh, affected the way the people lived in those houses. So it was uh, both of them, it was uh, uh, the lack of uh, technological resources or advancement and it was the impossibility to get the prices they needed to promote it among, among the working class. Do you have any advice for Nimrod? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, for me, the issue of uh, that idea of uh, the universal, uh, you know, it was uh, 
the main criticism these architects in the 1920s got, uh, the lack of identity. And uh, I know that uh, you discussed the, the way you, you uh, staggered the windows to give some kind of sense of differentiation, but uh, standardization, uh, Kropis himself reflected on that in the 1950s. And he said, we failed by trying to standardize absolutely everything. Total standardization does not work. Uh, partial standardization could work, but uh, that's, uh, that's here the, the issue that uh, you can rearrange pieces and you can uh, play with that, but uh, not as a, a universal uh, standardized form. So, so yeah, I, yeah, my point on universal, my point on universal was not on the style, actually. Uh, was mainly on construction method and uh, the idea. Uh, I think style should be, you should have multiple styles and uh, uh, multiple layouts and this shouldn't be, the point is not to have one style that will cover the whole land. That was not the point. Uh, the point was uh, a, a construction method which is uh, much more efficient than what we have today in Israel and the political part about the land. Or the universal access, let's say. You know, it's housing yeah. for all. I think that's the argument. It doesn't have to look the, the same, but yeah. it's, it's for all. Um, just a question, um, for you wrote. Um yeah. And maybe to connect this to some of what the projects Mariana was showing us at the beginning of this session, um, have you thought, or what have been your thoughts about um, the potentials of the ease of the construction that you focused on um, in terms of, you know, it, the potentials for, for self-building or for, for um, bringing in um, inhabit future inhabitants or working with um, non-professional builders, given that to you, um, have created or are working with a system that is purpose yeah. so simple? Yeah, I think it has a big potential and I think uh, it, it doesn't, it's not a completely uh, non-professional uh, construction method, but uh, right now the majority of the workers in Israel are uh, non-native. Uh, of construction workers and I think uh, this is kind of uh, at least for some of the people it might be an entrance to to work with this uh, and to expertise in building buildings and I think this can be a, a very uh, probable thing for people to build up this actually the companies that create this kind of construction they actually sell it for self-builders. So it is uh, a self-building kind of uh, fabrication. I'm not sure if I want to get into the discussion of who is non-native in the context of Israel. <laughs> Seems like a highly charged uh, yeah. question. Um, but I think it's, uh, thank you, Jesse, for bringing up the question of production and consumption, which was you know posed by um, Silke Cup. What if we focus more on not on users and consumers, but as, as these residents actually also as producers in some way. And how that how the project might be thought through that lens as well, that um, the future residents play some kind of role in, in, in the production rather than being giving just the final product. So it's just something to consider, I think, in, in, in this yeah. framework. Um, uh, Mariana, you had a, a longer comment. Would you like to make that? It's in the chat, but I think it's... I, it was in the chat so that I wouldn't uh, need so much time in the <laughs> with the mic so that I could listen more to more people. But um, but before that, uh, if you want, I can read. But uh, if not, uh, no problem as, at all. Uh, just react to the prefab uh, discussion and the assembly, uh, Nimrod. Because uh, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Uh, thank you to Ra Rachel as well. Hakel, <laughs> sorry. And, because uh, that's that's a crucial discussion uh, here in Brazil, and it's related to universal. 
since we are discussing terms, perhaps universal here has kind of different uh, different importance, at least, uh, or different meaning, uh, since uh, we have a huge, uh, uh, what it's the so-called housing deft. So housing is a, is a major issue for most of the for a large part of the population. It's like around uh, six uh, million uh, housing deaths, and then and and in the constitution uh, we have a uh, right to to housing was included after a, a struggle of the pro housing social movement or uh, what we call here the urban reform movement. So making it uh, universal in the sense that Suzanne just mentioned for all, it's something important. And therefore, uh, the discussion, uh, Priscilla mentioned the word, the word here is, is industrialization. So should we try to make uh, the housing, the production of housing, less uh, craft uh, ma made or manufactured, but more like industry? Is that good idea? And and the, the, then the, the main question is the one that Susanna raised in the beginning. If it, it sounds so rational, so obvious that yes, if you, want, if you want scale, you have to, you need industry. If you want low cost, you need industry. So why it doesn't happen? Here it's a sector that is, uh, demands lots of labor. It's labor intensive. It's right the opposite of, uh, of the other sectors of the economy, which is capital intensive. And therefore, why? And then uh, I want I want to answer to this question because that's the debate. It's a huge debate. But uh, if you if you are interested, I don't know if you're familiar with debate. For perhaps, it's not that uh, I don't know if you are learning to learn something useful uh, to use in the Israeli context, uh, since there are so many dissimilarities. But perhaps it, it, it helps to reflect on 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 the subject. Uh, the only thing I can say is that uh, something that you said that um, technology uh, develops uh, in certain contexts. It's not usually uh, a matter of uh, having good ideas or not, and we have lots of history of that. Why? There were so many amazing inventions, and not only during the revolu Industrial Revolution, they started to get together with industry and so on. So it's, a, it's a, also a huge discussion on that. But uh, to put it in more concrete and more uh, recent uh, way, uh, it's, um, it has to do with what you said, sometimes the land uh, issue is so important then uh, the gains that a uh, developer would get uh, through um, using more technology, investing in technology, is not enough to, to, make, uh, to, to justify the, the investment so in the sense of capital accumulation, it's not necessarily rational. Perhaps it's more rational to just bring into my term, speculate or to, or to get the gains with the strategies of land rent and differenti differentiate different, uh, make difference between different parts of the city. And that means disinvesting one part, investing in another part. So all this kind of a strategy. So the, the brain or uh, I'd say that the minds, uh, it would be more uh, focused on this kind of strategy. That doesn't mean that uh, there was not uh, efforts on the other side as well. We do have examples recently of efforts on the uh, technology side, but I, I don't want to talk more than that. And, and now that I talk too much, I want to uh, read the, the comment, but it's there if you, if I mean, you want it. What's fascinating and, and basically a proof of concept that you can address the larger issues through a piece of architecture is this debate that's going on right now, right? So. Um, you know, how do you, both related to the terms we use and to the things you're proposing. So, for instance, I mean, I understood you to precisely say this is not about mass production industrialization. That's why you're choosing the steel and not the, the concrete, because you don't want large developments. Uh, am I frozen? No. Okay. You're, you know. So I think, you know, like teasing out how you pitch this and how you make the argument. So it's not misunderstood as large-scale, economies of scale, industrialization, the way the debate that Mariana is now um, putting on the table. Yeah. But rather, no, this can actually be done on a building-by-building building basis. And, yeah. and, and I think that's, um, it's, it's just so interesting that we're, we're all, we all have so much to discuss, whether, you know, whether the term universal immediately suggests, well, everybody has to live in exactly the same apartment, or whether it suggests, no, this is, 
you know, as you said in the beginning, universal health care seems totally obvious to you. Um, to us here in the U.S., it's like it seems politically undoable, not not feasible. But conversation yeah. has changed, and it's around also about how it's how it's talked about. Um, anyway, so I think it's it's just it's great to to have these. Um, that again, I thank you for putting a proposal on the table because I think it takes a lot of courage, because then all of a sudden you have a very tangible thing that we're all picking apart, right? So, or you know, doing a historical reflection. Of insulation <laughs> from taking any real uh, position. Actually. Yeah, on Monday I I show it to uh, activists, so we'll see how they take it. Again, it's about how you frame it. You know, it's how it's. You know, maybe it's not about yeah. an activist design, but the design is a is a door to start the conversation. I think most people don't consider these points. Uh, the point of uh, mass building is something that people think of only when they pass beside the uh, neighborhood and they see all the buildings looking the same. But it's not in the conversation usually. I think that the, the cost of living, uh, uh, the quality of living, uh, uh, they are much more important to people. And to point, I think I want to say something about this, uh, the, the point of industrialization and the lack of uh, of uh, uh, diversity because in Israel the, the construction is not it's like half half it's it's not very industrial it's more like uh, in the lecture by uh, I forgot her name but uh, Brazil the, the silky silky cap silky cap yeah so it's very similar to what she described and but the result is very uniform so the uh, it doesn't it doesn't imply anything i think in the in in our days um industrialization or non-industrialization uh, are not the main uh issue that create uh the, the the uniformity of houses and rather the economic uh, uh, issue that the, the, the huge plots of land are sold to one contractor who hires one architect. And I think it's also connected to something that Gaia, that the, the citation by Gaia, that she talked about the neighborhood as a, a, a design construct instead of a social construct. And I, I, I think this is maybe uh, a basic thing here. If, if you look at the neighborhood and you say, I will design every, every building in this neighborhood as an architect, then you probably make something that is for efficiency, more or less the same. But if you, if you look at uh, 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 parcelation by, by citizens and not by uh, uh, conglomerates, then you probably will have a uh, more diverse uh, design, even though it's more industrial or less industrial. I don't think it's that relevant. Um, very short comment that leads to what Nino said uh, before we started um, about the, the difference in context, how something that uh, looks uh, very important in one context uh, is not that important in the other. And, uh, but then Susanne said something uh, that's the beauty of the discussion, isn't it? <laughs> to meet uh, from different realities. Um, it's 10.39 here. Should we go until 10.45? And then we actually have a three quarter hour break before the, the round table. Sure. I, mean, I feel like we're already, but we can go longer. How, how's everybody feeling? Yeah, I think a break would be good before um, the roundtable, if possible. But um, so, um, I encourage you all to yeah, just speak. What's what's on your mind? Um, I think that the last round of discussion about uh, the uniformity of residential production in Israel, which is independent of the production method, you know, whether it's industrialized or hand built. Um, in a way, links nicely to typology and lifestyle. You know, so is this does this have to do with the sort of 
um, consensus on lifestyle and how, mm -hmm. how people aspire to live in Israel. And it, accordingly, the, the market produces yeah. that. So. But, but I'm, I'm not so sure it's, it's how people choose to live. Uh, I think it's more of a top-down uh, decision in, in many ways, which was in, in the beginning of the country, it was uh, the state uh, that build neighborhoods. And now it's private companies, pr huge private companies that build neighborhoods, but people are just used to it. So, and this is the, the political power because when, when people have their ability to build their own house, they are very creative and they do a different kind of house, maybe even too much. Uh, so I, I would say it's a, a, a political construct much more than a lifestyle con uh, construct. I had a question or a comment um, actually um, for, to connect this, this debate about um, the, the neighborhood as a completely designed unit or these, uh, these kind of complexes that we've been talking about. Um, I was wondering, um, Raquel, if you could talk a little bit about um, the, 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 the longer life of the projects you described, to what extent um, did the kind of ideology that formed them remain present and say how they're um, lived in today or um, what populations, how, how they're perceived and understood and used? Uh, I believe that uh, most of these uh, 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 housing estates that were built uh, in, for example, in Berlin mm -hmm. by this uh, cooperative, uh, uh, how are they called, uh, cooperative uh, agencies or whatever they, they, they are called, they do work fantastically today. They even uh, upscaled the kind of population that lives in there. So if you look at uh, this, uh, uh, for example, the Uncle Tom's Hut, uh, uh, Zedlund, this one, it was uh, designed for the working class and the truth is that uh, today is used by middle class intellectuals and uh, you know, uh, professors that uh, are uh, living in a small unit, but uh, they do not need uh, any more space. So the kind of population upscaled uh, the, the use of the buildings. And uh, uh, you can see it in the way they are uh, preserved and all of that. In, in the uh, economic sense, I believe that uh, in Germany is especially important that idea of uh, cooperative building. And uh, it still works very much uh, all over the country. So I am not, uh, so much into into that aspect of uh, German development, but uh, it, it is still a very important way of uh, financing construction, and uh, uh, people engage in this kind of uh, cooperative systems uh, uh, gladly because it's a, a true possibility of uh, getting a house of of your own. In the case of uh, other complexes, well many were destroyed. But uh, uh, if you look at just in front of that uh, Uncle Tom's Hotel is the other one I showed, uh, I shown uh, the, the house that, that called, um, I forgot now the name, uh, the, the one with the pitched roofs. They do like them very much. And uh, now it is uh, a world's heritage and it is preserved uh, nicely and, uh, and people truly like that kind of environment. So I don't see any uh, important difference between one and the other in the way people just uh, live in there and perceive life in those uh, apartments or, or those houses. At, the, at this point, so so I don't see true difference between one and the other in that sense. Um, I just have to add one uh, unfortunate uh, fact, which is that uh, a lot of them were privatized. So a lot of these, I, I just know about Berlin. So they're, I don't even think they're still a cooperative structure. They most definitely have given up the nonprofit status. So the 
the process of yeah that was the discussion with the uh, Karl, Karl Marchale as well so so yeah the problem with Berlin specifically is that uh, it was uh, really cheap because it was not such a, a, a nice city to live in and uh, after the unification then you got uh, a completely different perspective so the the city sold plenty of these uh, units to particulars and to these uh, very large large companies that uh, again speaking of speculation that comes uh, this term comes uh, very much in hand and uh, now they had to revert that decision with a huge cost because uh, uh, people living in those uh, buildings in Karl Marx Allee were just uh, uh, putting so much pressure on the, the, the Social Democratic Party that governs Berlin. So they had to rebuy certain parts of Karl Marx Allee to give uh, uh, low rents to the residents that were already there during the German Democratic Republic. So the problem with the gentrification in Berlin is especially a big, big concern for the society as a whole. But uh, yeah, you can go on into the discussion about uh, the Airbnb and uh, whatever that uh, problem of uh, gentrification has brought to the city. So it's a, it's a, a huge, huge issue. Yeah. Thank you. I think we, we Suzanne, when we were there in the Wohnungsfrage Academy, I don't know if you were also part of the yes. group. Uh, perhaps you, you went already well, also. Yeah, we visited some of, I think it was Bruno Taut, uh, isn't it? Uh, there, was a, there was a kind of uh, memorial or a small museum inside it. Uh, anyway, it, it was an, uh, uh, I don't know what, how to call that uh, academy. It was a kind of short, uh, course or something like that and uh, we went to visit uh, Priscilla you just a quick comment because I know we are using now can you guys hear me two things one is what I think people should do is that really some contextual differences that I think you know if you Thinking in this terms of habitation, something for for the, the main the core group to think about is, but anyway, um, um, but I but one thing that I also I would like I I I think it would be interesting to be explored in the future is the spec the speculator or the speculation that uh, Marianne is talking about, but then considering. Um, uh, ownership, private ownership, and rent and rental market, because we see after the housing crisis of 2008, now the housing the the housing bubble in the U.S. in the United States at least is is a lot associated more associated to the or it's it's being expressed in the incredibly uh, expensive uh, rental market, um, to the point that people are buying houses again. Because it's cheaper to buy to pay for their mortgages than than pay rent. So I know it's not the the moment to discuss here, but it's just like in the end uh, the discussion what what uh, uh, Raquel was saying about um, the the you know the houses that that were privatized had to be bought again, uh, which is something that we uh, that we see in other cities. Is that I think. It, you need to explore this. We need to explore this differentiation uh, between the rental market and the private property and the um, home ownership. Sorry, in this language of the markets, you know, which is the this panel. <laughs> um, I'm going to propose wrapping it up, and I would ask uh, Francesco if he has any last thoughts because you haven't spoken for a while. Um, thank you. Susan. No, I I think uh, I will. Uh, it, it it's a while that I would like to ask to to Marianna if uh, she can deepen a little bit the the comment she said because uh, I think uh, she she did this comment uh, regarding the the loft uh, as a as an ideology, but uh, also then how. 
uh, architecture can materialize this ideology. And uh, I think that it was also relevant uh, with the Nimrod di discussion because uh, actually I saw his, uh, his project uh, as a sort of materialization of an ideology. Um, so I will ask to, to Mariana if uh, she can uh, uh, ex explain maybe more uh, her comment uh, that uh, she, she bring in the chat. Uh, should I do it, uh, Susan? Yes, please. Why don't you do it as a as a concluding uh, remark? I truly believe as a concluding. Great, I think we Good. All <laughs> and uh, I think you to bring some of these questions to the round table. Uh, we're we're okay. letting the participants sure. speak and not us. Uh, we want to hear from you, so please. Um, yes, oh, and we hope. Uh, yeah, we hope we'll be there because we really need to listen a lot to you but um so the no what i was trying to to say it's at some point i, I think susan mentioned um I, i'm not sure if we can uh, discuss uh, loft as an ideology in the same sense that hakel was discussing her and and then uh, i i remember that that yesterday uh, i am taking also part in a conference a political economy conference uh, due to time zones, it's, it's possible I'm here with you in the morning and I am there uh, in the evening. And in the evening there was a panel in which uh, Leda Paolani, uh, it's a well-known uh, economist uh, here, uh, political economy or radical economics, uh, if you want to put it in that way. And she was uh, saying that, uh, she was discussing the three main, uh, just that I wrote there, the three main responses to the crisis of accumulation of the 60s, the, the word, uh, the, so the so-called crisis of the welfare state, of Fordism, word uh, neoliberalism, uh, China economic growth, and the debt-led growth regime that some people call the um, financialization or um, finance-led uh, globalization, things like that. So, uh, and then uh, I realized that uh, when you take the ideology of uh, laughter from the US to China, uh, we can discuss perhaps in that terms, uh, of course, there was not a shift of hegemony from the US to China as uh, some uh, economists thought that uh, might be the case, such as a Higi, but uh, there, there was a shift uh, of production to China, and then the ideology comes as well, but it, it adapts itself to different, um, different um, pattern of accumulation. And uh, so that's why I thought that uh, there is a lot to think about. Uh, if you look to the, through the lenses of uh, like examining and architecture, there is a lot to think about uh, this important uh, structural shift uh, in, in the economy. Because you can see all that, you can see how neoliberalism expands in different ways, in different contexts, how it happened in China. Then China, of course, economic growth of China has to do with a huge urbanization process. It's part of, I think, of the explanation of why the growth was so intense that uh, China was still not uh, such an urban country. Brazil did that before. We are a urban country for many decades. And in China, it happened recently, so it's important. And adapt to that growth regime, since um, the, the, the people are very much invited uh, in China also to, 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 to make um, loans in order to get into this kind of uh, new style. And so that was kind of connections. And to, the, to end, <laughs> the last sentence was in the, that I wrote in the chat was then perhaps architecture materializes this in some way, hence the importance of studying it uh, as its completeness and, and um, form for abstract process. So very abstract for, for process of capital accumulation. And, uh, but uh, then, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and then, uh, not just we study, then I thought, but just study, why you study so much? Also because we wanted to, to transform. There is a, a Latin America author, uh, Jose Marchi, who says, conocer es resolver. So if we know, we, we can uh, try to save it, uh, save it s somehow. So also the importance of transform, transforming architecture in a radical way. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your contributions and your time and your thoughts and energy. Um, I hope to see you in half an hour. No, 35 minutes, even more. 35 minutes. See you at the round table. Thank you so much, Suzanne, and thank also you. for the comments on the draft of the, the paper. And thank you yes. all for the questions and presenting and sharing your work. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye.